uh, out of the service, uh, realized that uh, general aviation became quite expensive, and I still wanted to enjoy flying, and wanted to find a little less expensive way to do it. So I watched ultralights uh, progress from uh, what they were in the early days to what they are today, and was impressed with them after a few years of watching them, and decided to get into it, involved into it. So it's a cheaper sport, it's a less expensive sport, and I can afford to do that like most people, and I've never had uh, so much fun in my life in flying as I have since I got into ultralight flying. Uh, it's a safe sport. Uh, uh, it can be only dangerous when you uh, act a fool, like any other sport. Uh, I don't go on too many cross-country trips. Uh, maybe a couple hundred miles is, is about the most that I've gone on. Normally, uh, ultralights are, as far as I can see, uh, they're fun airplanes and they're they're made to go 40, 50 miles away from where you take off from. And uh, that's where the most fun is. And I normally don't fly too high. Uh, five, six, seven hundred feet, maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred on a trip or something like that, depending on the weather. But normally low. Low is uh, fun for me. It's out of the road of uh, general aviation aircraft and it's safer flying down air. I don't get afraid of heights that way. Yeah, I fly the Kolb airplane. It's a two place side by side Mark II model. I uh, built it in 1989. Uh, took about 450 hours of build time for me. That was uh, almost every night and almost every weekend. About eight months, eight and a half months to complete the airplane. Uh, they come from Phoenixville, PA. Uh, Homer Kolb uh, designed it, builds the kits, sends them out. Very good product. I'm happy with mine. I like the, uh, the versatility of the Kolb. I bought it because it folds up. Uh, the wings and I can put it in my trailer and not have a lot of hangar space. I happen to have a hangar now here, but for the first four or five years, well, I didn't have a hangar and the foldability is what attracted me to the airplane. Uh, I'll roll the plane out and do a little pre-flight uh, for you on here. We'll open it up to get started on our pre-flight. I've already done a, a pretty thorough pre-flight prior to rolling the plane out here for Brian. Uh, I don't like to be bothered too much when I'm doing a pre-flight. So uh, the pre-flight I'll do now will be answering some questions and pointing out some of the things that I look for on the airplane during the pre-flight. Uh, when I do a pre-flight, I always start at the same place every time. I end at the same place every time. I do the same things every time without exceptions. I'm looking for loose bolts, uh, a cotter pins broken, uh, uh, frayed cables, uh, anything out of the ordinary that might be a problem in the air or on the ground. I haven't flown in quite a while, but whether I have flown uh, yesterday or 10 years ago, uh, the pre-flight would be the same. First thing I check for every time is a switch. Switch must be off, of course. I'll be playing with the prop later, looking at the prop. So I don't want the switch to be on and engine to start for safety reasons for that. So I'll start with the switch, go through the instruments, go through the cables, uh, check the pins and clips and so forth, walk around the airplane, end up on the other side of the airplane over there. Make sure the ignition switch is off. Pretty important for obvious reasons. My switch is here, located here. I have actually two offs and one on for emergency purposes. Make sure it is off. I check my brakes next, make sure they move, make sure they need no lubrication, make sure they work properly, check my rudders. Physically look back and make sure your rudder is deflecting and in the right direction, number two. Checking my control stick, checking my elevators, ailerons, looking back, making sure the elevator works full throw. Make sure deflection is in the proper direction as well as plenty of throw up and down, both of which are important, obviously. Make sure there's no interference at all in the cockpit. Check to make sure the cables aren't interfering with anything. They go through some back here. We always have stuff in the back of the plane, through the fuselage, make sure there's no interference. Checking for frayed cables as well. Throttle action is here as well. Make sure there's no interference between the two or three different actions there. Checking seat belt security, primer bulb, primary engine. 
I'll go ahead and put my choke on now. Checking everything in the aircraft fabric brake system. Check and make sure pins and click keepers are in on the struts. Check our cables for looseness. Check our strut to make sure it has play. Again, checking our keepers. Make sure the keepers and pins are in. Checking our struts, checking the brakes. I don't just look at things. I grab them, I pull them, I beat them, I kick them to make sure anything can look fine to you. And as soon as you grab something, it could fall off in your hand. So everything I look at, I try to grab, move, kick, bend, uh, everything I can. It's gonna get a lot more abuse than that in the air than what you're doing here on the ground. These clips, of course, are important. The pins are important, but the clips are more important. These little uh, 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 keepers hold the pins in. The pins uh, connect the uh, strut to the airplane, but the little keepers right here can be removed by anybody or even kids real easily. Checking the fabric on the lower surface of the wing. Beating edge is important. Checking fabric all the time. Cuts, tears. It may be there intentionally or accidentally. Move the wing up and down. Check it. Move it back and forth. Make sure it's working fine. Make sure there's not going to be any damage in the air. Checking the ailerons for deflection again. Checking your hinges. I can feel them as well as look at them. I can actually feel them better than looking at them. Make sure the hinge pins are in. I can feel the, each end of the pin. A little piece of safety wire I have there. Check for tautness. Check for loose and play. All the way across. Checking ailerons back across. Checking for looseness here, play, play in the wing. I check the control push rods again up under the engine here. You have the engine itself. Again, let's make sure my Velcro strips are down, taut. Checking gearbox for leaks and so forth as I, as I pre-flight. Grab the engine, move it back and forth. Shake it, make sure it's rigid, make sure it's securely fastened. Nothing loose, nothing broke, nothing leaked. Everything looks good and secure. Check the prop back and forth, move it. Check it down to your fuselage. Checking for uh, nicks, cuts, scratches, dings, rocks, anything like that around your tail. Again, checking my hinges, checking my cables for tautness, rigidity, bolts are tight. Check for tears in the fabric that might cause a problem. Up and down, securely, pins. I have some pins in here. I have a pivot point. I have a couple of pins and clips keepers. I have cables. There's a lot of things in here to look at. Looking for loose nuts, bolt, braid, anything that might look good. Looking also for cracks uh, on the frame. Uh, check your rudder for deflection, movement. Tail wheel on down. Checking everything, moving everything with your hand. Grab the tail wheel. Check it. Move it around. Check it out. Make sure you're greased up. All right. Move things back and forth. Kick them. Move them. Move around the other side. Same thing on this side. Check your elevators. Check for deflection, check for movement. Make sure nothing's hitting, nothing's rubbing. Bolts, pins, clips. Make sure there's not a lot of play between the two. It's two, two separate elevators here. Checking fabric, touch things, feel things, looking at them. Down your pins, all your fabric, back around. Sometimes you want to get down, look up underneath. Things uh, that are easily visible uh, are easily found, but things that can cause problems sometimes are underneath where you don't have a tendency to look. So get down, look up around things, something that might be unusual on the bottom that you may have not seen before. On back up your fuselage, again this side for the bolts, checking fabric, checking keepers, checking pins again, elevators. Different wing, up and down play, back and forth play. This side of the engine, checking for leaks, fuel leaks, oil leaks, anything that might look like it's unusual. Gearbox leaks, carburetors, make sure they're rigid. You grab the carburetor, move it up and down, back and forth. If you're going to fall off, it should fall off in your hand now, not in the air and through the prop. Always hit your spark plug caps. Make sure they're on. Make sure everything's secure. Check your cables for frayedness. Check your brackets. Check for rigidity. Checking all your controls, again, from the back side, a different angle than from the front side. Both things, back and forth. Pushing, pulling, again, check your fuel capacity while you're here as well. On out the wing feeling along with looking. Leading edge again, right on down just like the other side. Pins, clips, struts, fabric. Brakes are secure. Tires are working, bearings are okay. Move things back and forth, twist them, bang them, right on back to where you started from. 
Check your windshield, check your radio mount. Everything inside looks the same, but take a glance at it at a different angle. Maybe you can see something you haven't seen before from the other side. And we're through with our pre-flight inspection. Dual carburetor installations is an option on most airplanes and are not really part of the airplane kit themselves. So they must be installed by the individual himself normally. So uh, I found in my experience a lot of carburetor installations have, have not been exactly proper and I wanted to go over with you a couple things on here that would make uh, your installation a little bit easier. First thing we'll do is take off the air cleaner to give us access so that we can see the carburetors themselves and the slides inside. We'll remove that. And the first thing we want to check after we install the carburetors is to make sure that they're in line with each other and in line with the crankcase of the engine itself. And you can simply do that with a straight edge, any straight edge will work, making sure the tops of the carburetors are in line with each other. If you're tilted to one side like that, you're going to have a rich or a lean uh, cylinder. One will run richer or leaner. So first thing we do is level them with each other, straight with each other rather, and straight with the crankcase with some kind of a straight edge on the top. The next thing we'll do is check the pull on the throttle slides themselves. Now I have access to my uh, throttle cable right here. You may not have that uh, access to it. You may want to work your throttle level itself or have someone do it for you uh, in the cockpit. I can work mine right here, run these up and down on the single cable. cable. The splitter is right here in the two. Uh, so we want to make sure uh, in the beginning that at full throttle, these slides are at the top position uh, the same. We can check the top position by feeling them with our thumb fingers. We can see them as well. We might want to make sure that these are at the top and they are, they are exactly the same with regards to each carburetor. We can adjust that by these adjustments on top of the carburetor right here. Uh, once we have this part adjusted properly, and then we worry about the bottom end second. This is more important on the top. You're at uh, full throttle a lot more uh, than you are at idle. So then we'll come down from the top position at full throttle, back down to the idle position, bottom them out. Now right now they'll be sitting on these screws right here of the carburetors. This is your idle speed, not your idle mixture. These are also idle uh, adjustments so that you can have these stop at the same time, just like we had them stop at the same time on the top. Two different adjustments. This is on the top. This is for your bottom of the carburetors. And you can set those. You can hear it when they both hit at the same time. And you can actually see it themselves. So, and you can feel it. If you have one hand on both carburetors, you can run these up and down against the stop. You can hear them. If they're out of sync, you can hear one click before the other click. So start at the top first, and then do your idle circuit last. That way your carburetors will always be in sync. The engine will run properly, and one engine uh, cylinder won't run uh, any harder than the other cylinder. Running without air cleaners in airplanes are, is, is a whole lot better than running without them in motorcycles or cars. However, it's not advisable. Uh, you do get dirt uh, in the air. So uh, the carburetors are actually adjusted and jetted with air cleaners in mind. You really should never run a carburetor without an air cleaner on it. They will run different, leaner or richer with or without the air cleaner on it. So uh, for contamination purposes of the engine and longevity of the engine, you should never run uh, a Rotax engine or any other engine for that matter without an air cleaner installed. Uh, different types of air cleaners, some are better than others. Any good air cleaner is better than no air cleaner at all. So if we start at the top by leveling the carburetors, we start at the top of the throttle slides, making sure they're top out at the same time, work our way down, make sure they bottom at the same time. Then your carburetor in a dual carb installation is complete and your engine will run a lot better and longer because of it. What we can look at next here is our frame and our motor mount area. Now, the motor mounts here uh, may not seem uh, too significant uh, in a way of uh, color, but the color of this motor mount is painted a light color for a very good reason, <coughs> and that is to make sure that you can easily detect cracks in your motor mounts, or for that matter, 
any type of control linkage you may have, any type of structural part, uh, uh, mostly metal or even aluminum, that you want to check for stress. If this Mortemont, for instance, was painted black or blue or any dark color, you would not be able to see cracks were they to develop. Uh, cracks in any mortar mount is critical and could be deadly. So the reason that you see white all over my area here is the fact that it is for easily detection of cracks. Now, it saves me time on pre-flight as well. I can pre-flight a white mortar mount, a white engine frame, look for cracks, do my checking a lot faster than I can a dark colored mortar mount. Let's talk a second about engine component alignment. Uh, cylinder alignment in specific, engine crankcase alignment. Uh, one thing I've noticed uh, in repairing uh, the Rotax engines uh, is uh, that the engine crankcases must be aligned properly around this surface here for proper seal of the gearbox for those gearbox engines. The newer engines uh, fit a little bit better. The older engines uh, require just a little bit of uh, attention regarding shifting of the cases. Now, uh, when you uh, assemble the crank cases, it does have on the crankshaft aligning rings. You do have on the front of it, of course, your magneto, your backing plate, which is used for alignment upon assembly as well. But we're concerned uh, about the backing plate and magneto, also about the alignment of the two surfaces at the rear of the engine or the PTO side so that we have a proper seal. So when you install the two crankcase halves together, pay close attention to both forward and rear for a proper seal. If this is out of alignment, the O-ring will not seal properly on the gearbox itself. Consequently, you have a, a leaky gearbox and you have to kind of goop it back together. And that's not the proper way. So if you take a little bit more attention, align these cases real nice and smooth across the back so that when you put your gearbox on uh, you have a proper alignment on your o-ring along with that the cylinder alignment here is important a lot of uh, engines you'll see leaks exhaust manifold leaks and it may be uh, simply uh, that the uh, upon assembly that the crank uh, uh, case cylinders were not properly aligned before they were tightened up you can use any good straight edge uh, to align them. Uh, Rotex provides some uh, specific tools for alignment of crankcase uh, cylinders. You have two surfaces here to worry about, one on each side. Single carburetor manifold is much more important on the intake side. These surfaces must be in line with each other. When you tighten this down, if it's out of alignment, you could crack your intake manifold. On a dual carb system, where you have separate intake manifolds, it isn't as important on the intake side. Uh, however, it is still important on the exhaust side so that you can prevent exhaust gas leaks, exhaust gas manifold leaks. So when you, before you tighten them down, tighten up both sides with a plate of sorts to align them properly before you retorque the heads. All right, let's talk a second about piston decarbonization of Rotax engines, or any engine as far as that goes. Uh, a lot of times, engine problems are a result of lack of maintenance on engines. And that can be caused uh, by uh, not removing the carbon off of your engine properly at scheduled uh, times. The rings can actually get stuck in the piston, similar to this, where you can't remove it. If uh, carbon isn't removed periodically, rings can stuck, engine failure can happen, just like that. To remove the carbon, I've seen a lot of engines, just people pulled their heads off, decarbon on top of the piston, decarbon the heads, replaced it, and think they call that a decarbon. The problem is there that the rings need decarbon, it's just like the head and the cylinders do. The carbon on the ring grooves gets stuck. That does not permit the ring to expand, not seal properly. Combustion can bypass the ring, heat overheat the piston, and seize the motor up. 
to remove the carbon, you have to take off your cylinder head and cylinder. Uh, if you're delicate, you can remove the carbon with the pistons uh, on the rods themselves. To do it properly, they really should be removed from the engine on your workbench. I take an old ring, a ring uh, I've broken half. I use the ring itself to remove the carbon from the groove. It's a perfect fit, obviously. I also use some dentist tools to fine pick the carbon out of the grooves themselves, along with a solvent tank. These are some of the tools that I use, different ring for different pistons. So proper decarbonization of the piston and decarbonization means the rings must be decarboned as well for proper engine maintenance.